Okay, continuing with phobias. So we know from early studies with classical conditioning that fear can be conditioned. We saw that with the little Albert study, the classic um, sort of uh, now considered immoral study that was done with little Albert where his fear was conditioned. It, he was taught to be afraid of the little white rat. Um, we don't believe, researchers don't believe that the disorder is typically acquired through these behavioral means, um, through conditioning or modeling. So even seeing someone, you know, be, maybe being raised by someone with, with a specific phobia, that's not exactly how the disorder is acquired. It's a combination of factors. However, using some of these behavioral theories, are uh, useful for treatment. So again, as I said, fear has a purpose. It keeps us safe. Um, some specific phobias are much more common than others, and many of them are things that we kind of should be afraid of. Heights can be dangerous. Um, germs can be dangerous. Spiders can be dangerous. So there does seem to be some uh, connection there with uh, a protective um, part of our brain where, where it is, um, you know, required for our species to continue that we're afraid of some of these things. It's just the system has gone into overdrive in some individuals and the fear that they have is either over exaggerated um, or they've also, they've developed other fears associated with that or because of that, they've started to avoid more and more things and sometimes individuals can acquire additional specific phobias. So uh, this, uh, one, of the, one of the common treatments for phobias is something called systematic desensitization, which sounds like some sort of, you know, crazy thing done by the CIA or something like that. But it's what it really means is that you desensitize the person very slowly to their phobia. So whatever it is that they have a phobia about, you put them in a state that is incompatible with fear. So a very relaxed state. And then you have them, you expose them to what it is they're afraid of it very gradually so that they can tolerate more and more of this stimulus and maintain that state of relaxation. Uh, virtual reality has been very beneficial in, as a tool in this therapy. Um, you know, if you, if you, uh, you can put the person in a situation where they feel like they're, you know, at the top of a very tall building, um, that might be part of uh, the therapy. Flooding is a style of therapy that's uh, also a little controversial. Um, the individual needs to have full, you know, awareness of what they're doing, but it's basically uh, flooding the person with what it is that they're afraid of. So if you've seen some of those, you know, reality shows or game shows or whatever they are, where people are in a box and covered with spiders or, um, you know, someone with a fear of heights, bringing them up to the top of the Empire State Building or having them go bungee jumping or something like that would be an example of flooding and Typically, it can work in a motivated patient, um, but again, it's not certainly not a style of treatment for everybody. Uh, modeling, again, is part of this behavioral therapy where you're watching someone do or be around what it is that you're phobic about. So treatments for agoraphobia uh, are very similar to many of the treatments um, that are used for all the other anxiety disorders. It's a combination of cognitive behavioral therapy. So talking about what the person is fearful about, lots of support from a supportive uh, therapist. Group therapy can be very helpful. Uh, of course, nowadays there's a lot more options for group therapy including things like telemedicine. Sometimes therapists will go to the patient's home, you know, particularly if they're really very, very much struggling with agoraphobia or if the disorder has been present for a very long period of time. Uh, like other disorders, uh, relapses can occur. Maintenance therapy is very beneficial. Checking in every, 
you know, once therapy is relatively successful, checking in every six months or three months or every year, depending, of course, in, on the individual. Social anxiety disorder uh, is another type of anxiety disorder. Uh, it tends to come about in late childhood or early adolescence. It's typically when we see the first emergence of it. Uh, there are very good treatments for social anxiety disorder. Um, and again, it's a markedly um, above average, above what's considered normal anxiety about being in social situations. It's out of context for um, what the situation might be. So many individuals are fearful of speaking in front of crowds. Um, you know, that's considered sort of a typical response to speaking in, in a large group. Um, but even, you know, many individuals can function in their daily life without having to speak in front of large crowds. However, if you're nervous about going to the grocery store because you might be evaluated by others or you might do something that's embarrassing or you, and again, it's causing this significant distress or impairment. This this uh, part of the disorder is key, that it's, it's interfering with the person's everyday life. They avoid social situations, they worry about them beforehand. Social situations almost always pr produce anxiety. And again, you can see how this might also have some of those comorbid disorders such as depression, substance abuse. Is, it's not uncommon to see that with social anxiety disorder also responds very well to cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, you know, things like virtual reality therapy would most would be very beneficial uh, and encouraging the person to do and be involved in the situations that they're anxious about, again, with support. Uh, some of the other things that can be added to treatments for social anxiety disorder, uh, in addition to the cognitive behavioral therapy and sometimes medications, again, remember those benzodiazepines can be habit forming. Antidepressant drugs have also been successful to some degree. Also, um, building on some social skill um, ideas and some assertiveness training. Uh, you know, the sort of completion of therapy might be to give a speech to a group of individuals. Uh, so, another topic that you may consider for discussion, uh, how has social media affected um, social anxiety? Has it improved social anxiety? Is it increasing rates of social anxiety? Um, and also what's the impact of COVID, the current COVID crisis and all of this online learning, hybrid learning. Is it beneficial to individuals with social anxiety disorder? Um, is it harmful to those individuals? Is it a mix? It's something, you know, along those lines, if you'd like to add that to the discussion. Okay, so panic attacks is uh, something you may have heard about. You may have seen people uh, talking about panic attacks in thing, you know, in social media or portrayed on movies or TV. Um, a panic attack is a relatively quickly occurring, uh, re relatively short period of panic. Although to the individual, it feels like you know it, it's a very long period of time where the individual feels an overwhelming feeling of panic and all of those physical ex experiences, physical sensations of panic and fear that again, many of us have felt. Uh, this occurs outside of um, you know, a, a typical situation where you would expect someone to be panicked. Uh, it's out of range for what would be a, considered a normal response. The person can experience heart palpitations, tingling feelings in their body, difficulty breathing, uh, hot and cold flashes, chest pain. Some individuals will even go to the emergency room believing they're having a heart attack. Uh, it occurs in a significant 
a portion of the population, about 3% of individuals have experienced a panic attack, um, and about 5% over the, over the course of their lifetime may experience a panic attack or panic disorder. It's another one that tends to emerge in late adolescence or early adulthood. Uh, anytime you see these um, uh, ratios or percentages, um, keep in mind, you know, women are more likely than men, non-Hispanic are more likely than white Americans, or white Americans are more likely to, it used to be believed that for panic disorder, for example, white Americans are more likely to um, experience a panic attack. What may also be something to consider is not that they're more likely to be to experience a panic attack, but they are more likely to be diagnosed than other racial or ethnic backgrounds. And this can also occur among the sexes. So it used to really be believed that women were much more likely to experience depression than men. Now we know that women are more likely to be diagnosed with de depression not necessarily more likely to suffer. Men are typically underdiagnosed for disorders like depression. So always keep in mind when you see that is a matter of really the numbers are different or um, the diagnose the rate of diagnosis is different. Many seek treatment for uh, panic disorder. It can be very uh, disabling and uh, it can be accompanied with agoraphobia, that fear of leaving the house. So panic disorder, the uh, panic attacks need to happen frequently enough to um, really interfere with the individual's life or cause concern, uh, cause disruption in their everyday life, in their ability to live life um, in a meaningful way. Biologically, uh, there does seem to be some connection with the amygdala. Uh, the amygdala is this very small almond-shaped portion of the brain. In the lecture notes relating to trauma, the amygdala is heavily discussed. The amygdala responds to trauma and tends to be very affected by trauma. Um, if you look at the brain, the amygdala is also very close to the hippocampus. If you remember from intro to psychology or other biology classes, the hippocampus is very responsible, very much responsible for the formation of memories. So it's believed that this fear and formation of memories are very close in the brain, that they're very closely related. The upside is that there are treatments available for panic disorders and other anxiety disorders that can um, significantly improve the function of these brain systems and improve quality of life for many individuals. Again, drug therapy is effective but has to be used with great care. So um, antidepressants have been used and are considered a little bit more safe or significantly safer. They're not necessarily as habit forming as the benzodiazepines, uh, a drug like Xanax, as you may have heard or may know, has a very high risk of dependence and addiction. Sorry, everybody. Okay. Uh, so cognitive behavioral therapy, like many of the other anxiety disorders, is the sort of preferred overall method. Uh, medication therapy may be necessary, particularly in the beginning, um, but ideally cognitive behavioral therapy should uh, be used and maintained uh, for best outcomes. And cognitive behavioral therapy in this particular disorder will address um, the thoughts that the individual has relating to their fears or phobias and the behaviors that they engage in that may strengthen those phobias. So decreasing their avoidance, increasing their comfortable feelings with what it is that they're afraid of. We'll pause for the next video.
card three. 